promise you we'll try not to run long tonight. Oh, I don't know. Nothing's working here. Maybe we will have a prayer meeting. <laughs> Do we have my presentation up back there? You don't know. Okay, I don't either. I just don't see anything. Whew! Can't do too much without it. I didn't bring a hard copy because I thought, well, things are going to work pretty well. Oh, there's my buddy. He just got to Oklahoma City. Yeah. From Pennsylvania. That's a long jaunt. <laughs> All right. I really do need that up. Without it, I'm kind of like a fish out of water. Okay. All right. We have seen in our study that Job is really a real-life person, just like we are. And you will find that as you look into the book of Job, Job is a very, very, very complex book. And it's very, very challenging. In order to make it somewhat simpler to understand or easier to understand, I have just simply taken the four people that speak to Job, three friends and another one that comes along, and we're going to and we're looking at each and every one of the dialogues that they have. Well, you can't take everything. So what we do is I kind of pick and choose. Oh, there we are. Thank you. So we kind of pick and choose. And the book of Job, we have come and we've said that Job was a man of unmerited suffering. Not only that, often he is used today as a typical example of how one, of one who is a suffering servant. Each one of us, we have all been there. We are all servants. We have all suffered. And suffering may come up as different ways to different people. We may define it differently. But as we begin our study here, and by the way, if you hear that jingle every now and then, I put it on the airplane mode, but it's still jingle. I guess I could turn it off, couldn't I? That's another bad, good option. Hello, power off. Well, let's see, I guess it might work. Let's look at some things that we have established already. We have established that Job struggled. He struggled with phenomenal internal turmoil. Some of that will become obvious today or tonight. The question must have tormented Job was, why? Why do the righteous suffer? Well, I suspect that you may have known someone who has articulated that very concern. And if you've ever been to a point where you're suffering, you may say, why? Well, Job's condition was so bad that his friends didn't even recognize him. They didn't even recognize him. And there were some ground rules laid, we find, and the ground rules that were laid were laid by God. The God told Satan that he would not attack Job. So Satan complied, but Satan, Satan had a rule too, that he was to get Job to verbally reject God. Well, those were the ground rules. And amidst Job's calamity, or let's say his tragedy, Job tore off his robe. He shaved his head. He fell to the ground. And in spite of all of that, he worshipped God. Huh. I'll just leave it go. The bottom line was this. In all of this, Job did not sin with his lips. 
perhaps there's a point of encouragement here. Have you ever got to the point where you said, I can't take any more? <laughs> and to your dismay, your disappointment or whatever, more came? Well, God knows John a whole lot better than what John knows John. And he knows each and every one of us more than we know ourselves. But nevertheless, we find here no matter what happened to Job, Job no matter what beset him, and he's going to be pretty figurative on what, was, what he was going through, he never was obedient to the suggestion made by his wife, cursed Job, cursed Job, cursed God, and die. Well, we're going to talk tonight about Job's friend, Alphaeus. He was a terminate from Edom, a land bordering ancient Israel. Today, it's the south, it is the southwestern part of Jordan. Well, now we can say that, and everybody says, right. Well, let's see if we know what we're talking about. Here's a map of the Jordanian area. And you will notice, I wished I could use my, well, I can, actually. You'll notice right here, this area right here is Jordan. And this is the area where Alphez was from. The southwestern part of Jordan, which borders on Israel. That's where it is today. Well, let's talk about the first dialogue we have here between the, quote, so-called friend of Job. We find that in his first speech, or in the very first dialogue, we find that Alphaz attempts to reconcile Job to God by trying to induce him to repent. Wow. Wow trying to induce him to repent. Alphaz, by trying to do this, look what he implies. He implies that Job was a pretty bad guy. Now this dialogue that we're talking about takes place in chapters 4, verse 1, through chapters 5, verse 27. So we're going to pick and choose some things, and we're going to go through there. And we're going to look at, some, look at some things. We find that he implies that Job was a pretty bad guy. Because he says this in chapter 4, verse 7. He says to Job, whoever perished being innocent. <laughs> Boy, now that's how you talk to somebody who's down and out and really suffering. But he also said, where were the up, when, where were the upright ever cut off? Same chapter and verse. Well, we know that he's implying here, one, Job, you're not innocent. And the second thing he's implying here is, you aren't very upright. Because you've been cut off from God. Well, those who plow iniquity and sow trouble, guess what, Job? They reap the same. What do you think you're reaping? Wow. And he is Job's friend. Well, it doesn't stop there. He says, by the blast of God, they, that is, those who plow iniquity and those who sow trouble, they perish. Job, beware, you're not far from perishing based upon what I see. You're in pretty sad shape. But he goes on. Is somebody going to say something? Okay, I'm sorry, don't sneeze. <laughs> don't sneeze, Tommy. <laughs> and he tells Job, he says, by the breath of his, that is God's anger, they are consumed. Chapter 4, verse 8. Boy, aren't these just wonderful words of encouragement when you're down and out. And then Elphaz gets off onto a tangent. He tells him about a vision and what he heard. 
Now, this is really what Job needed to hear, right? Well, he says, a word was secretly brought to me, chapter 4, verse 12. He goes on further and he says, and my ear received a whisper. Wow, sounds to me like he's really dreaming. But look how intense it was. He said, in this vision that was secretly brought to me, that I heard whispering, fear came upon me. And he says, all of my bones shook, and the hair on my body stood up. Chapter 4, verses 14 and 15. That was a pretty serious event, I would think. And I heard a voice say, verse 16, Can a mortal be more righteous than God? Verse 17. He says, Can a man be more pure than his master? Well, those are pretty much rhetorical questions. <laughs> a mortal person can't be more righteous than God. I don't know of anyone even angelic beings that can be more righteous than God. But he says, can a man be more pure than his maker? We don't need those. They're self-answering questions. And then in his wisdom, he says to Job, call out, chapter 5, verse 1, He says, is there anyone who will, who will answer you? Boy, is he getting nasty. He's almost questioning Job's faith. Is there anyone who's going to answer you? To which one of the holy ones will you turn? Ooh, now this is a friend coming to a man near death in dire straits, and this is, is a friend? Wow. <laughs> Did everyone hear, hear that? <laughs> With friends like him, you sure don't want enemies. <laughs> well, we go on a little bit further. And he says, affliction does not just come from the dust which just happened to be where Job was laying. In other words, it doesn't just happen about a spike. It doesn't come out of the air. Affliction does not come from dust. Affliction comes for a reason. Oh, really? Well, thank you for telling me that, friend. <laughs> he says, nor does trouble spring from the ground. What magnificent words of encouragement. Well, he's kind of locked and loaded, and he's kind of letting Job have it with both barrels, isn't he? This is what his wisdom was, Alphys's wisdom. Happy is the man who God corrects. Therefore, do not despise the chastening of the Almighty. Boy, when somebody's down and out, aren't those the kind of words they need to hear? It's almost like he's implying that Job's circumstances are directly accredited to the Lord. He's doing this out of spite. Let's see if we can simplify what Alphaz has gone through and said. He says, I've got all the answers. Remember how you counseled other people? Job was known that. He was a judge. Remember how you held out hope to those who would walk in integrity? Remember how you encouraged them and said, never give up hope. Keep on doing what you're doing, the right thing, bringing glory and honor to the God. Be a person of integrity. Be the person God wants you to be. 
Do you remember when you held out hope for those kinds of people, Job? But he also said God punishes the sinner. <laughs> well, I'll tell you, when times are tough, this is not the type of a person you want to have come visit you to encourage you, to build you up. He also says, if I were you, I'd turn to God. Well, there's nowhere in the scripture is it implied that Job turned away from God. But he says, I got the answer. I got the answer. He said, God is clearly chastening you. And when you turn to him, he'll restore you. Have you ever had someone approach you like that? Or have you ever had anyone that you may have approached and say, repent? Repent. Turn to God. Have your sins washed away. And we may never have known the circumstances upon which that person was living or walking. I think a lesson we're beginning to see here and develop in the book of Job, perhaps we need to be thoughtful on how we say and what we say to people who are down and out. Because, you know... Years ago, I used, to, I used to teach a class on communications in college. One of the classes that nobody ever wanted to take, but it was mandatory. <laughs> so I always had a class. <laughs> but think about this for a moment. It's not the message that is sent that is important. What's important is the message that is received. Because though we may have the greatest intent in our hearts, though we may have all wonderful thoughts and feelings of encouragement to help someone, maybe what we say does not accomplish what we set out for it to do. I think I may have used this example in class one. I've had many funerals and have had many people or I've had the honor of doing the memorial services for many people. And you cannot help but overhear some things when people, because usually the preacher is standing next to the family, and you can't help but overhear some of the things that are said. Well, when you just lost your loved one, you define loved one. And someone comes to you and says, I'm sorry, but they're in a better place. That's almost like a slap in the face, isn't it? Yes, it may be a statement of fact. It may be true what you're saying. But that may not necessarily be what that person needs to hear at the time. Job was not in a place where he had to hear these statements that, that Alphaz was, was saying to him. He said, God is clearly chastening you, and when you return to him, he will restore you. Well, that's just what Job needed to hear. Well, you interested in hearing what Job said? Job's reply is chapter 6, verses 1 through chapter 7, verse 21. And I just picked and choose some things because some of the things are pretty heavy. Difficult not only to understand, difficult to comprehend and figure out why in the world were those things even said. Well, Job's reply we find in chapter 6, verse 14, where it says, To him who is afflicted. Kindness should be shown by his friends. Well, now, if anyone should know the need of someone who is down and out, someone who is distressed, someone who is near life's end, someone who doesn't know when what they're going through will ever end, Job says, to him who is afflicted, Kindness should be shown, 
by his friends. Wow. Magnificent words of wisdom. But he also says, what does arguing prove? <laughs> oh, we never get into arguments, do we? We never get into discussions over biblical things, do we? Well, I guess Job and his friend Alves, were, they really were arguing with each other. But he says, what does arguing prove? Chapter 6, verse 25. But you know something we begin to see here? We begin to see something that each one of us can relate to. We see Job's human side. Look at here. Job asks God, have I sinned? Wow. He asks God, what have I done to you? Chapter 7, verse 20. He goes on and says, what have you set me, why have you set me as your target? Have you ever felt like everything was falling on you? No matter how hard you tried, no matter what you did, it just did not seem to go right? If you've never walked that mile, my prayer is that you never have to. But if you take on and begin to walk that mile, there may be questions like this will enter your mind. I told you the story of me when I was going through a pain that I was told it was the most painful infusion that you could ever receive in a hospital. Now, if any of you here are nurses, I don't know how accurate this is. I can only repeat what I was told, but I was going through a potassium infusion, and it's so painful they don't give you one big bag. <laughs> they break it up in the little bag, so I guess we can have a break. Well, I thought I knew what pain was. And the nurse said, are you ready? <laughs> I have learned that when a medical person asks you, are you ready? <laughs> you may not know what you're in store for. But it started, and I said, yep, yeah, order. She says, are you okay? I said, I'm fine. Any discomfort? None. And it started to wall her up. I started to feel so much pain. I, I thought I knew what pain was, but it took it to a new level. My legs were going like this in the bed, and I looked at her and I said, you have two options, sweetheart. I tried to keep it nice. <laughs> Turn off that machine or knock me out. She, she ultimately turned off the machine. Well, we went through a period of time when we started it again, and there wasn't any difference. I didn't ask God, have I sinned? I did not ask God what I have done to him. I didn't ask God, why have you set me as your target? But these are the words I said in my heart. Actually, I think we could say I, spiritually I was yelling them. And I said, do you hear my prayer? Why don't you hear my prayer? You never want to be there. I suspect that Job may very well have been there and more. He said, why do you not pardon my transgressions? Chapter 7, verse 21. He goes on to say, why do you not take away my iniquities? You know, the period of time when Job was living was in an age that we call the patriarchal age. 
the, law, the Ten Commandments had not been given. This was prior to that by hundreds of years. And if the Ten Commandments had never been given, the law of Moses did not even exist. So man did not know what he was to do, what he couldn't do. But in the patriarchal age, God spoke directly to patriarchs. He spoke directly to the heads of the home, the male heads of the home. That's how Job knew what was right. That's how Job knew what was pleasing to the God, to God. That's how Job knew how to live. There was no such thing as the forgiveness of sins then. They just knew that sins existed and they weren't supposed. Let's see if we can simplify the words that Job said to his friend. If you, that is, Althes, only knew, if you only knew how much God is making me suffer, I wish he'd crush me and get it over with. Perhaps there are some here who have been there. Matter of fact, I feel pretty certain there are some here who have been there. Can you just imagine what he says, what he was saying to his friend Alphaz? You're, you're a lot of help. <laughs> but in spite of this, he says, Okay, Alphaz, show me what I've done wrong. But he didn't stop there. He says, I tell you the truth, I just can't be suffering chastisement. I've been good. And he's not saying that in a boastful way. He's saying it as a statement of fact. I have been a righteous man. We've read over in, in chapter 1 that he was blameless. Chapter 1.1, 1, 1, we find that Job was blameless, upright, and one who feared God and shunned evil. He knew what was right. He said, I've been good. Oh, how I'm suffering, he must have said. And he just found, I just can't keep quiet any longer. I tell you, I'm terrified. I'd rather die in a minute. I submit to you that Job was in such straits and in such a condition that he was desperate. He was desperate to die to be relieved of the anguish that he was going through, of the torment that he was going through, of the pain that he was going through. You remember he had sores from the bottom of his feet to the top of his head. They were weeping, they were bleeding, and he took a piece of broken pottery just to scrape them. Wow. I'd rather die in a minute. And here's a question that we perhaps can bring forth to us today. The question is, why does God let this happen? If I'd sinned, he could have pardoned it. What's happening to me? Have you ever been to a place where you say, maybe not why God is letting this happen, but Maybe you've never been there, but maybe you know someone who has said, why me? What have I ever done to deserve what I'm going through? God, help me, tell me, show me, what have I ever done? Hmm. The human side of Job is perhaps a glimpse of who we can be today. There is so much here in the book of Job that goes so deep into the, into the lives in which so many people live. Have you ever 
How do I want to say this? I had a family one time ask me to go and visit their father who was struggling with ALS. Well, ALS, those of you who may or may not know, it is named Lou Gehrig's disease. And I must tell you, it's very horrific. More horrific sometimes than others. It will literally tie your body into a knot. I mean, your limbs will bend ways that they're not supposed to bend. And the pain must be so excruciating. And this woman says, can you go pray with Daddy? How humbling it is to find yourself kneeling next to someone who is lying in bed, their body tied in knots. Pain must be unspeakable. What words could I say to him? The only words I could think were trust in the Lord. Trust in Jesus. His eyes open. ALS will also impact your ability to talk. For all that was in him, he looked at me and he said, I trust in God. Closed his eyes and rolled over. What can we say? Well, that had such a profound impact on me that I actually had the time to be with my father in the latter times of his life. And I looked down and says, Daddy, trust in the Lord. You know what his response was? Son, I don't have any choice <laughs> in the matter. <laughs> I trust in the Lord. Well, those are hard words for a son to say to a father. But I don't know what it was like for the father to hear those words from a son. But I hope that they were consoling. Well, my father, he always had a sense of humor, and he says, well, son, what choice do I have? I don't have any choice. Job was in that place in life. Oh, Dayton. Uh, I think of two individuals. My uncle owned a farm outside of Rome, Texas, with a place called Ropesville. And one of the trainers from what was then Reese Air Force Base uh, crashed on his farm. And so he and a neighbor get to the crash scene. And it turned out it didn't erupt in fire, but it had hit at such an impact that it was about a seven foot hole in the ground. And they got to one of the pilots. I think the other one was already dead. And uh, they very carefully took his just smashed body. Uh, bones were mashed together in a horrible condition and they got him into a vehicle even before an ambulance could get there to try to move. But the point I'm making though is some four or five times Uncle Ben said, he said please kill me. He was hurting so much and uh, I think later he had died. But I think of Job's agony here. And then the other thought related to a fellow that went through school preaching, preached down here at Purcell for several years. Incidentally, was a former magician.
God. Who dares to deceive us? And live longer than anyone I know of. I visited him a number of times when he had already lost the ability to talk. And he had a machine, and he would type out his answer for you to uh, have some conversation with him. But he had a unique spiritual touch with God because he'd come really from quite a background otherwise and appreciated the grace of God. And I think of him, he lived longer than anyone I know of who grew very disease, something like 20 years. Oh, wow. And uh, it just kept eroding different functions. And uh, he had about any equipment you could get that could help him. But I would go in and he actually, uh, maybe a little bit toward like your father, but he would respond with some comical statement in his horrible condition. He couldn't talk and he couldn't walk. And thus was bed fast for some three years before he passed away. And I think of him as a dramatic example of God helping a man through tribulation. Part of all, did some good preaching before he died. But those two are right here in these chapters. Mm, they sure are. <clears throat> and you know, I have said this in my previous class. The disciples must have been so sad when Jesus told them he was leaving. But look what Jesus said to them. It's to your advantage that I go. What do you mean it's to my advantage that you go? You have been my life for three years. No, it's to your advantage that I go so that the Holy Spirit can come, or so that I can send him. You know, we find there that, I think it was John 14, I may be wrong, but in, in the Gospel of John, that we find that the Holy Spirit is your helper and my helper. He is your comforter, he is my comforter. Well, how well can he help us? How well can he comfort us? Well, if we put him in a box, then he can only do what we think he can do in the box. But if we define the Holy Spirit who was given to us at the moment in which we were baptized as the very divine nature and the very divine Spirit of God came to live in you. Now, if he, the Spirit of God, was the creator, which he was, he can help us, he can strengthen us, he can comfort us in ways in which we do not know. Perhaps, just perhaps, Job has allowed us to see, as Dayton said, his human side of what he was called. Let us always remember that a person in need, as Job has said, needs to be comforted by a friend. Now it may be a difficult time and a difficult situation to put yourself in, but take yourself out of the picture and put the other person foremost. And ask the Spirit of God to give you what you need to say. And the scriptures promise you and me that he will give us the words to say in the very hour in which they are to be said. May we never forget God loves us. And Job will find that out near the end of this letter. Thank you. Uh, one thought, this is shifting over to Eliphaz and then, but trying to understand each of these unique personalities uh, I think of Matthew 7, 22, because in this context we put that to mind. He said that he got visions and uh, was able to do <laughs> the message that he needed. Matthew 7, 22, Jesus said, many will say to me in that day, did we not prophesy by thy name? And in thy name cast out demons, and in thy name do many mighty works. 
yet it was one that got these visions, and we should have people today getting visions, they claim. But Jesus said, I never knew them. And before Job was finished, uh, God basically told those three, he didn't know them either. If they didn't shape up, they did have a chance to repent, and apparently did. But uh, I think if you were trying to classify what kind of a personality was Peter has, one that gets visions, one that can cast out demons, just like people are still and Jesus would say to him, I never knew. Kind of sobering for you to ask. Oh, sobering words for all of us as well. In Matthew 21, 22 is one of, one of many scriptures that I have committed to memory. But it says this, all things, all things whatsoever you ask, Here's the key. Believing, you will receive. When we find ourselves in situations as we see here with some with Job, may we with all sincerity of heart, mind, and spirit trust in the Lord and petition him and perhaps ask the Holy Spirit to intervene on our behalf. He is our helper, and he is our comforter. I'll close with this one question. Do you want gifts from the bank, or would you like to have the bank as a gift? The Holy Spirit is the bank as a gift. We'll close here for tonight. We have seven minutes to get home, and I don't know if you want to watch what's on TV or not, but we'll, we'll break a little bit earlier here so we can see and be whatever may be around to, to watch tonight. But let's part, let's part with a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, thank you so much for the first book ever written in the Bible. Oh, may we never have to relate to what Job has gone through, but we ask in the name of your Son and our Savior that you never leave our side. Broaden our borders, never leave our side, and may we never cause anyone any hurt. We're told, Father, that you heard that prayer from Jabez. May that be the prayer that we pray for you to pray to you tonight. Thank you for your word. Thank you for your Holy Spirit who lives within us as our comforter, as our helper. Help us to become more aware of the great blessing that he is to us. Help us to continue to learn much from your book of Job and help us to make applications to our lives as we have become friends of those in need. Go with us now. May we forever and always be your faithful servants. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank you.